everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Podcast. My name's Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group. I got another action-packed discussion about global energy here. Not only is Dr. Brooks, Dr. Robert Brooks, he is the founder and chairman of RBC, RBAC, and I mean, he is a phenomenal uh, thought leader, but he's also just back from uh, China, and we've been talking about some of the global impacts that are around the world, and I absolutely have loved my conversations. And Dr. Brooks, right before we jump in, I just want to give your son a shout out because he's in Africa right now, and I've had three podcasts with him already. Wow. And I mean, they have been phenomenal. Uh, I can tell he's got a lot of your uh, knowledge and passion for running around the world. So thank you for stopping by the podcast today, sir. Uh, well, thank you. That was quite an intro. Uh, I hope <laughs> I can live up to it. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks for the shout out, you know, to my son, Cyrus. Uh, he's he's really a great uh, young man, and uh, he's actually more of a world traveler than I am, actually. Uh, he's wow. been all around the world, spent a lot of time in Australia, in Asia, married a girl from China, lived in Korea, uh, you know, lived in Australia for many years. And, How you know, cool. he's, he's just all over the place. Anyway, you know, he's been interested in Africa for a long time, and um, uh, he's going to be spending some time in South Africa there for, you know, the next few months and uh, wow. you know, brought his wife, which was really great. Uh, so she's going to be working, you know, from Africa. Um, you know, fortunately, nice. both of them can work remotely and, and uh, you know, still be productive for uh, their companies. Um, nice. and, and yeah, so it's great. And I'm, I'm really excited to hear from him. I haven't really heard too much from him regarding his experience at that African Energy Conference, but yep. you know that's. Um, I know you know we're probably going to focus a little bit more on China, but I will say that you know I think uh, one of um, my passions that yep. I have not really figured out how to do much about, right? Uh, but is to see that after hundreds and hundreds of years of suppression, the the people in Africa uh, actually catch a break here. And, um, yep. you know, it I seems like what's happening, uh, and I hope Cyrus is going to be able to clarify this, you know, from his experience there, it seems like that a lot of Africans have come to the conclusion that depending on Europe or North America or even China is probably not a great idea after all of this stuff. And that, you know, they better take yep. the bull by the horns themselves. They've got plenty of resources. Yep. Uh, they do need, you know, they've got a huge resource base. Uh, they need to, to somehow, um, you know, uh, bring themselves up by their own yep. bootstraps inside Africa on on the basis yep. of those resources and and they should be able to do this yep. uh, they do have impediments to doing that you know history is one thing uh, corrupt rulers is another thing right. just the just the um you know just the abject poverty uh yep. is another is another uh challenge that they have uh but i think that actually i think they're up to it I think they're up to this challenge, yes. and I think they are starting to actually move ahead on this. Right. And uh, good-hearted people around the world need to be good-hearted and hard-headed at the same time. I don't know how you are able to do that, but somehow yeah. be good-hearted and hard-headed at the same time helping uh, this uh, trend along. So I, I wish them the best. I, I tell you, the fun thing is this morning, uh, your son, Cyrus, uh, got a set up with the secretary general of the African Petroleum uh, Producers Organization, kind of like the OPEC of about eight, uh, 18 different countries. And mm -hmm. as visiting with the secretary general, uh, Dr. Uh, um, Amin, uh, Amin uh, was just super, super, you nailed it. 
That's exactly what he's doing. He's out there shouting that. So uh, were you on that podcast by any chance? I'm just I was not. No, I was not on that podcast. But <laughs> but you sure picked uh, it all up. Well, that's interesting. And, you know, I guess that means that there have they have that, you know, the uh, some of the voices of Africa have uh, have gotten through. You know, they're yes. starting to get the message through. And, you know, some of us are listening. Uh, so uh, I, yep. I think that's great. I'll tell you what, um, natural gas is such a critical piece in future for elevating uh, humanity out of energy poverty. And uh, before we jump in, I just want to ask, uh, if you don't mind, uh, you're the ch uh, founder and chairman of RBAC. And tell us what that is, because that's really important why you got to China. Rather than just jumping right in, tell us a little bit about uh, what you do and the importance of your global market, if that's okay. Uh, well, thanks. Yes. Um, well, uh, RBAC is is a an organization I founded, you know, many years ago. Uh, it was basically the outgrowth of a private consultancy of myself, which is where the RB of RBAC comes from. And uh, so, when I started adding people a number of years ago, it became R Robert Brooks and consultants. So there's the RBAC. Oh. Uh, but then uh, I actually had back in the late nineties, I had an epiphany for me, which was uh, that being in the consulting business wasn't really the best thing for, you know, what I really wanted to do. Uh, but rather uh, I decided that the best way for myself and, and my fledgling organization right. uh, would be to create uh, some uh, analytic software and then to license that to the industry. Uh, right. And that uh, the industry could use this for their own purposes on their own behalf in, the, in their own way that they wanted to do it. Uh, right. you know, one of the problems with consulting projects is that you, you sort of define the scope of work at the beginning of the consulting uh, project, and it may involve uh, the consultant using certain tools to do certain analysis or whatever. Right. But you know, when the project's done, you know, the recipient of the work, you know, the, the one that's funding this, have a very limited amount of flexibility in terms of saying, but okay, this is it, interesting, but what if this, or what if that, or what if that, or what, what if this? Right. And uh, of course the consultant's gonna say, sure, how much more you know, do you have? How much more money do you have to pay for it? Because we're not gonna do it for free. So right. you know, our idea, the business uh, model we had was, let's, let's license for a fixed annual fee Right. Uh, this software tool that can do a lot of that, and then the licensee can run as many scenarios as they want to. Right. It's like the incremental cost is zero, right, of running the additional, except for the cost of the consultants inside the company. And even that is a fixed cost. So you know, basically, you know, it gives them greater flexibility to use the tool for their own purposes in right. their own projects, whether they are themselves consultants or whether they're energy companies or whether they're government agencies or whatever it is. Yep. So that business model really worked well for us and enabled us to expand from me to about 15 people, you know, the, what we have and uh, the people around the United States and in China. So we do have people in China nice. uh, and, uh, you know, in Texas, of course, well, of course you got to have them in Texas. Uh, California, Pennsylvania, and, uh, you know, various other places. So, um, so anyway, that's our purpose. I don't know if I explained it well enough. Our focus has yep. been on the natural gas. You mentioned natural gas. So yep. it's not all energy commodities, uh, natural gas and related things. We've done work in natural gas liquids, for example, which is a very interesting market. And we've also done work that was related to the power market because of, as you know, a lot of power is generated using natural gas. So natural gas and power are closely related. And of course, natural gas and natural gas liquids, which be propane and ethane and butane and that stuff, right. obviously uh, very much related as well. Oh, so yeah. you want more or is that enough? Oh, no, that's a great start because when you and I started our, our podcast last time, 
which is done very well. We're, I mean, uh, selfishly as a podcast host, you always try to find industry leaders and experts that are good, a knowledgeable, b fun, and uh, their their material goes off. So you're like, yay, you're yay. back. Uh, but <laughs> here's the the thing: you were just about ready to go to China, and I really mm. wanted to get an update from you on your trip to China. Because as China is really important in the entire energy global market and finding out what you had in some of your meetings and, and some of your insights to the global uh, energy market. Okay, sure. Uh, let me tell you about that. So you had asked before, well, how did I, why did I go in the first place? Well, I was invited to speak at a conference, an uh, organization called DMG. Uh, puts on conferences around the world, including, uh, oh gosh, this the huge, huge conference, it's Gas Tech or something like that. Um, uh, they, uh, my son, actually, Cyrus, uh, went to the one, actually, James, my other son, went to the one in Singapore uh, oh, nice. not too long ago. And then there was one in Dubai that was like, I don't know, 57 you know, exhibit halls or something. It's just huge, apparently. Wow. Maybe it's Abu Dhabi. But in any case, um, I didn't go to that one, but I was invited to speak at this one in China. Now, um, I was invited to speak without a specific topic. So I, I was, you know, uh, in other wow. words, they said, you choose the topic. Uh, so, wow. yeah, that was... Well, that was pretty good. And, um, you know, we knew that it that did have to do with natural gas, but also other forms of energy. And and it right. did have to do, there were sessions that had to do with hydrogen and ammonia and so forth as well. Yep. Um, but uh, I chose a topic that had to do with, you know, essentially uh, energy, energy security, <laughs> supply security for China. Okay, China is a very interesting place. And again, focusing on natural gas. Okay, so, right. um, you know, to get ready for this talk, I had to do a fair amount of research, uh, not just using our own tool and database, but do other kind of research and found out some interesting things. Uh, for example, uh, you know, China actually produces a lot of gas itself. Right. And, and it is it produces about 60% of the gas that it needs for its market. So they're still buying a ton and they're, they're still buying it. They're buying a ton. Um, and it turns out that about, about 15 to 20% comes in from pipelines from central Asia, from, um, uh, from Myanmar a little bit, and also from Russia uh, growing in from Russia. Right. And the rest is LNG, and they've been building LNG import terminals like crazy all along the coast from right. northern part of China all the way through the eastern down to the southern. I mean, it's just they've got like 30, 30 LNG import terminals either built under construction or planned. I mean, it's it's a lot. Yeah, that so huge. it is huge. And, you know, China is a huge country, as everybody knows. I mean, it's you know, essentially as big as the United States in terms of land area, but they've got almost four times as many people. Uh, so, yeah. So, um, and you find that out, by the way, when you go to one of these cities like Beijing, yep. you know, which has almost 20 million people in Beijing, uh, it's, wow. uh, it's, you know, um, you know, you go to downtown Houston, it seems like it's um, a ghost town compared to Beijing. You know, I mean, it's, or LA for that matter. It's just, I mean, I, I, really I want to live Those where I, 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 sir, I don't, I live where there's nobody. <laughs> I love talking to people every day, but not a, I'm not a, uh, me and my 20 million closest friends. I'm not that kind of guy. It's, um, uh, you know, it's really, I mean, this gets into the China, you know, into the story about China. It is quite a um, credit to to China and to the Chinese people and even to the government, you know, whatever you would, you know, local government more than probably the federal government, that they are able to have these giant cities and actually make them work pretty well. I mean, you know, even looking at transportation is pretty amazing. Uh, you go to Beijing, uh, if you have never been there, of course, you don't really 
have maybe an idea of, of what it's like. But, you know, if you go to L.A., for example. Right. You know, there are some really big boulevards, right? If you go to like Wilshire Boulevard or other kinds, you know, these are pretty, pretty big streets. And they're sort of major streets that everybody knows about. Hollywood Boulevard, Wilshire Boulevard, Sunset and so forth, all of these places. Well, you know, in Beijing, they have these kind of boulevards, but even wider. And the traffic yeah. is just incredible. And the thing is, the traffic is not like L.A. or Houston, where it's a bunch of cars. It's a bunch of cars, a bunch of bicycles, a bunch of scooters, <laughs> a bunch of covered scooters, delivery vehicles. You've got everything except my daughter, when she went to uh, India, was amazed that they had all of that on the streets, but they also had a lot of animals. They had elephants and this and that and other stuff you don't have any animals on the on the roads in china but you got a lot of people was and it clean they somehow I mean, managed to make it work without killing everybody it's like it's wow. it's astounding was it clean and because i've always heard that is it really clean and no dirty and everything picked up and how did you that know, how it's that? really you know um it's a little bit hard to say because i stayed in the nicest part of beijing right you know uh, so uh, when you okay. when you stay i stayed at a hilton hotel that's sitting a, probably a mile from tiananmen square and the oh. and the forbidden city and so forth so this is it's called uh wang ju wang fu jang uh, okay. something like that 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 area and, and so, yes, it's, of course, it's really nice. You know, it's nice there. And one thing that you see, which is kind of interesting, is they do employ older people to kind of clean up the area. So you see these older people with these brooms that are very different from any broom you ever saw in America. You know, they've got these, I don't even know how to describe it, but, you know, the, the, the straw part, uh, you know, the broom part. Are, is about twice as long or three or four times as long as what we normally think of in a broom. Right. And it's all kind of spread out like this. And it looks like, you know, they, it looks like it's handmade. Right. But, you know, these older people are employed, you know, just, you know, kind of keeping, you know, keeping the sidewalks and so forth clean. So, you know, you look at that and you say, you know, well, it's pretty, pretty good. They've got something that, you know, people can do that don't have anything else to do. And right. You know, maybe they make a few uh, bucks or yuan or, you know, whatever, maybe. Um, and maybe they're just, maybe they just doing it out of civic duty. I don't know, but, but that's sort of nice. Um, but, uh, you know, those are things that you notice. Other things that you notice about China is uh, if you go around like to the parks and things, I'm a little, I was really kind of surprised at how much green space there is in Beijing. Now, first of all, Beijing is huge. It's like Los Angeles, except you don't, you, what you don't see much in China is single family dwellings. Oh, you yeah. see apartment houses. Okay. So it's more like a lot of upgrowth, you know, where these, okay. you know, giant apartment houses, you don't see too many, or I didn't see too many single family dwellings, certainly in Beijing. So what that means is you can actually have a lot of green space and then you have your people in these really tall, you know, towers. Right. And so you don't have single family dwellings sort of taking up all the space. So there's a fair amount of that parks and other kinds of things. But, you know, the other thing is that Chinese people are very culturally, you know, they are, I think, more interested in um, and involved with aesthetics. Oh, you know, cultural aesthetics than most Americans. Um, and, you know, I think Americans are pretty utilitarian. Uh, now, Chinese, I think, are also historically, but there's a certain aesthetic quality to life that is that you see you know, and you see it in a lot in the parks and, and so forth. And it, it's it's pretty nice um in in the hotels they you know they really make it look nice and so forth so you know there's a lot of good um you know i certainly am not let's say a um, what should i say a fan you know of the um of the highest leaders in china right. i'm actually not terribly much a fan of the highest leaders in the united states either to be honest with you at the moment um but <laughs> but the point is that the, the Chinese people, there's a lot of people who are really trying to make life 
work, you know, for mm -hmm. uh, Chinese people. And, you know, I think we have to give, you know, proper due to the authorities who've done this, because all you have to do is look back less than 100 years to the condition of the Chinese people. And it was very, very different. So anyway, I enjoyed my time there. The people are quite considerate that I ran into, uh, that I talked with or uh, dealt right. with. And, uh, and certainly the people at the energy conference, which were more uh, interested in here, uh, I found them to be, you know, just like anybody at any other energy conference, any place, you know, it's like they're interested. They're technical people. They're interested. Right. They're, they want to do the right thing. They... Chinese people uh, who are analysts or involved in the energy industry, they want to learn. They want to learn, you know, what the experience in America, the experience in Europe, because they're kind of going through a similar kind of experience in terms of, of evo evolution of their natural gas markets. And I know it sounds strange because there's so much top-down control, you know, by the government, but mm -hmm. it, it is kind of strange because there's also quite a number of private businesses. And there's also this attempt to sort of have uh, free markets with a Chinese influence or something, you know, I mean, it's a, yeah. it's, it's a, a little bit, uh, it's a little bit interesting um, along those lines. Well, their power uh, situation, if they have the, uh, you know, estimated 30 um, or, or so, however many uh, LNG uh, import, they are putting in, um, they have, I believe it's over 300 uh, coal plants permitted. I mean, that are already permitted in there. Um, how much are they trying to put in for natural gas versus coal? uh in their mix do you know i mean uh are they I, really I can tell you this go to that? well the, here's the here's the thing there's a lot of headroom for growth of natural gas in the power sector okay. uh, my understanding is that natural gas is actually maybe only five or six percent of the okay. uh, of the uh power sector you know generation uh from natural gas so you know you could imagine i mean even if they wanted to go to 10 or 12 percent you know that'd be like doubling the natural gas in their uh in the power right. sector now that's not their only consumption because they also consume gas in the industrial sector as well as in you know right. residential and commercial right. so they've got it and uh trans and transportation as well but anyway you could theoretically if they really wanted to say you know seriously uh, cut down on air pollution and that sort of thing, then they might want to go more with natural gas, uh, more with nuclear power, more with renewables and less with coal. Right. But the problem is this, and that is they have a lot of coal. I mean, and they got a lot of coal miners. So there's right. a lot of people who are working in that industry. And so when you look at it from an overall perspective, number one is you don't want your people to be unhappy, you know, Chinese people unhappy historically is not good no, you know, for bad. the leadership, okay? <laughs> uh, second of all, they have the coal there themselves, which means right. energy security is more in their own hands right. if, they, you know, if they use more coal. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think those are probably two of the main uh, things right there. I suspect that you know, they they will in certain areas and certain times they will reduce the amount of coal that they're burning uh, if enough if if enough complaints are coming in, you know, from the people about air quality. And and it's uh, clear yeah. because, you know, it's the same story that we had in the United States. I mean, look, all you have to do is go back to uh, England. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, you know, they had some horrible event uh, when they had fog and smog at the same time because of all the coal plants and thousands and thousands and thousands of people died. This right. was in the fifties. Uh, so, you know, that obviously the Chinese people would like to have good air quality, just like anybody in the United States or Europe or whatever. Right. And so you do have that dynamic that's going on as well. Right. However, any incremental gas is going to have to come from increased local production, which is slow and difficult. Right. Their formations are not nearly as good and prolific and easy to develop as in America. 
Right. Or they have to get it from Central Asia or from Russia, yeah. which has its drawbacks. Or they have to get it from LNG, which means they're getting it from, again, outside suppliers. Right. So I think I think the Chinese are sort of hedging their bets by saying, you know what, we're going to take all everything. Uh, we're going to use our local production. We're going to invest in that first. Uh, we're going to have pipeline gas from Central Asia, and we're going to try to work out really good relations with the people in Central Asia, the leaders. Right. Uh, we're going to get whatever we can get from Russia because we know they're in shitload of trouble anyway. Uh, so we'll, we'll we're probably going to get a good deal, good yeah, deal they, from yeah. them. Uh, and then, you know, we can have all this LNG import capability and, you know, make deals with people around the world. We don't have to depend on just the United States or just Qatar or just Australia yeah. or whatever. There's all kinds of LNG. Uh, so, you know, that's how we solve our energy security problem. There and, is a lot to be said for having an LNG terminals, uh, cause you can get it from just about anywhere. I mean, with the exports, you got the U S you got, uh, cutter, you got, um, even Israel, as you and I talked before, they, they go to Egypt and Egypt doesn't ha Egypt have spare capacity to export out. Uh, they have spare um, LNG production capacity, but they don't have enough gas to convert into LNG okay. uh, because they also have a growing uh, local demand for gas in, in Egypt. Wow. And so it has actually been a bit of a problem to them. They've had a couple of export terminals and they haven't been able to meet those contracts and so, you know, one of their solutions was uh, to work out a deal with Israel because of the availability of gas in these offshore eastern Mediterranean fields that Israel has been developing. Right. And so all, all of that was going along really swimmingly, you might say. Right. Uh, and then this blow up that's happened uh, recently, I think, is likely to, you know, put a halt to much of that. Uh, I, I read someplace that Israel was closing down some of its offshore pipelines, yep. uh, you know, because they're worried about them getting blown up or whatever. So, so anyway, yeah, that's, but here's the other thing, uh, actually from yep. a global scale, uh, on this Stu, most of the LNG that, uh, that Egypt would produce or, um, Algeria and so forth, most of that, I think ends up just going across the Mediterranean over into Europe. Oh, you know, okay. it's, it's short. It's it's not going to go to China very much, maybe a little bit or something. But most of it, I think, is going to end up yeah. going to places in Europe. There are some places in Europe that are underserved in natural gas, like Greece and Eastern uh, Europe. Yeah. And so there are places where it can go. And uh, there's other things, other plans to move some of the gas through Italy northward, uh, you right. know, through Switzerland and into Germany and elsewhere. So, but um, I would say the other interesting thing, um, I mean, there's so many things to say about that. You know, there's so many plans that, you know, have been brought up about the Eastern Mediterranean building pipelines and so forth, but oh, yeah. most of it is really impractical. And I think what they have done is to do the right thing. I think they figured out the right solution, uh, which is to bring that gas on shore, which they're going to have to do it anyway, anyway. Right. And then, you know, connect it up with Egypt. And, you know, because Egypt has that spare LNG capacity. Right. And as long as Israel and Egypt, uh, uh, as long as the peace agreement that they have between them is, right. you know, holds right. up, you know, they can make these things go. Right. Uh, so... You know, I think for both of these countries that, you know, having some kind of long term resolution of the Palestinian issue would be, you know, great, greatly to their benefit. And, uh, you know, certainly, as we talked about earlier, it would be, you know, in the end, you've got a couple million people in Gaza and I don't know how many people in the West Bank, you know, that those right. people, you know, I think. You would say, you know, just like America or any other Russia or China right. or any other place, most of the people would just like to live their lives and they don't really want to get involved yes. in all this other crap. So, yeah, I know I want to avoid crap. Um, yeah. But, but you know, when you, we, we sit back and take a look, um, 
uh, cutter or Qatar? How do you say? Do you say cutter? Well, um, I say uh, cutter rather than Qatar because I know Qatar is wrong. I know cutter is wrong also, uh, but it sounds more academic or something. I don't know. Okay, cool. Um, but you know, you can go, you can go on Google and say, how do you, how do you say Q A T A R, and you're going to get, you know, people that, but it's. It's yeah. everybody's opinion about how to right. say it. So that's one. That's one that I've heard about nineteen different ways. But uh, Qatar uh, or Qatar, uh, if you're French, uh, they just signed. I believe it was a past, well past uh, 2050 on their natural gas with Norway. Uh, I mean, uh, um, on, on their contract this past week, uh, that's a long contract in there. Those long natural gas contracts are huge LNG contracts. Yeah. Um, I think it's with, uh, I think you're referring to the contract with, uh, to total energies. Right. So it's, uh, French, uh, unless there's something else that I, you know, don't know about, but yeah. And there was another contract, I think with Japan as well. Uh, but in any case, you're right. I mean, it's not going to start until 2025 or, or so, which means it's you add 27 years to that and you're beyond 2050. Right. So so it is. And, and that's that is that is very, very interesting. Uh, but, you know, they have huge. I mean, that's the largest gas field in the world. And as you know, it's shared. It's actually one yep. giant field that's shared between uh, Qatar and Iran. Uh, so. It was uh, Shell agrees to buy gas from uh, Qatar for Netherlands past 2050. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, that was that was the second one. The first one was uh, to Total Energies, I believe. Okay. So, but you're right. This is another one, and I don't know why they chose 27 years, but you know that's that's what it is. Yeah. And so, what this means when they say Netherlands, this is supposed to be sent to the Netherlands, which you would think that means it's all going into Europe. But the thing is that the Netherlands has a terminal that you can re-export from. And so does Belgium. Uh, okay, I so know that you know, it could be delivered there and stored there and then moved to where the best market is. So, I mean, there's a lot of you know things, especially yeah. if you think about Shell and Total Energies. I mean, these are portfolio players. You right. know, so, you know, a lot of the supplies that they get, especially if they get them what they call FOB, that doesn't sound like FOB. It sounds like a what you call a DES contract delivery in right there. But from there, what is Shell going to do with it? They may sell it, you know, to Europe or yep. they may move it someplace else, you know, wherever the markets are. That's That's got to be cheaper than uh, uh, tanker storage. When you see it where prices drop so bad, everybody just parks their tankers into different storage areas. You, It's much better to manage your inventory that way. Uh, I mean, it just seems that way. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know the details of the pricing. I mean, the differences are, of course, but you're right. I mean, if you just have a tanker and you sit it off Gibraltar or you sit it off Singapore waiting for the market, uh, you know, you have to pay a day rate that's associated with that. You know, I mean, right. it's, you know, $100,000, $200,000 a day. You know, I mean, it's, it's not cheap, no. even up to half a million dollars a day. But, you know, these tankers, some of them are worth, a you know, more than a billion dollars, you know, in right. product. OK, so, I mean, they're I mean, hundreds of millions, whatever. So. Right. So what that means is. Um, I don't know, I, I may have misstated the number there, but it's a, it's a lot. OK, it, I mean, they're yeah. really worth a lot. And so what that means is maybe you're willing to take the hit of a couple hundred thousand dollars a day if. You yep. expect the price is going to go up in 15 days or 20 days, and you're going to get that much of a higher price for their product. So, right. you know, these these companies that do this are doing all those. They've got all kinds of young, you know, MBAs or quants or whatever who are doing these calculations and making those kind of decisions. But the difference is there. You're just parking it. Right. And then just yep. move it where the market is. If you deliver it to a tank uh, in the Netherlands or Belgium or France or something like that, 
right you incur the cost of actually deliver of actually loading it into the tanks offloading and then loading okay, so, and, and then right and then you store it and you lose a little bit every day storing it you know boil right. off gas and then you have to load another tanker and then move it to wherever so you know there's various costs associated with either wow. either way of doing it uh, they've got another way of doing it too by the way which is sometimes they'll bring a tanker in and instead of offloading to a tank, they bring another tanker in, sit it right next to it, and then just move the LNG from one tanker to another tanker. And then that other tanker goes off. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, they got it down to a science now. It's, it's totally a science for sure. Now, when um, with our problem in uh, Russia and you take a look at uh, Germany, uh is trying to ban fossil fuels and you take we take a look at this um uh that long-term contracts i believe were some of the biggest problems that didn't the eu go to just uh spot pricing and they really didn't have any long-term contracts don't long-term contracts go to more stable geopolitical scenarios yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, you know, certainly if you can get a long-term contract at a reasonable price, it, it makes yeah. a lot of sense. But sometimes it's a hard sell if you've got, let's say the Greens are in power and they're trying wow. to kill, they're trying to kill fossil fuels now. And right. then you say, well, I want a 27-year contract with Qatar, you know, for, you know, new gas supplies in Germany. You know, it's right. going to be difficult. Uh, so it's... Um, but, you know, you can get into trouble, you know, with that kind of thinking also, um, you know, India had actually made at least a tentative agreement with, uh, uh, with a company, um, a U.S. company uh, for LNG for a significant period of time. Right. Um, but then the price of LNG, the global price in Asia went down to $2 per million BTU. Right. And so they canceled the contract because they thought that they would do better by going for spot LNG. Right. But that was the beginning of 2021. Oops. And then in 2022, instead of $2, it was up at, you yep. know, $50, $60, right? Yeah. So in a way, you know, then it was too expensive for India and Bangladesh and, and all these places in South Asia and in Southeast Asia to actually buy LNG. So even when they had contracts, they had to just pay the penalties for not, you know, for not accepting because it was just too expensive. Wow. So, so yeah, so those, it's a, it's a hard game to play because, you know, there's, you know, geo, geopolitics can really throw the markets out of whack. Oh, absolutely. Now, uh, RBAC, your long-term software, your software uh, helps companies determine the viability of contracts, correct? I mean, when you're pricing models and you're taking a look at that, that's one of the core things of your company, correct? Yeah, uh, that that's absolutely right. So, you know, the way that it works is if, you know, if there's an existing contract, for example, and, you know, we, uh, we do a forecast and, you know, using our tool and the forecast indicates that, you know, in after a certain period of time, there's just not really the market demand sufficient for that contract. It right. can tell you that. So it would tell you, it should give, be able to give you a pretty good idea of when a contract is sort of out of the market, right? When it wow. really, you know, shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't have been made, but, but it was. So, you know, so you're saying, uh, we don't know about all of these things, though, right? Because, yep. you know, usually when you do these longer term forecasts, you know, you don't just, you know, throw uh, some kind of geopolitical event in at 2035 or whatever, because we can't forecast, oh, you know, yep. that, you know, such and such a war is going to break out or, you know, this is going to yep. happen or that's going to happen. I mean, theoretically, you could do those scenarios, but it's, you know, if you think about it, there's how many of them are there? There's like an infinite number of potential scenarios that you could do. Right. So typically the way you run these things is you assume that, you know, you look at growth rates and patterns and that sort of thing, right. but you assume that the markets are going to continue on average more 
more or less in uh, in an orderly fashion going forward. And just you want to see what you know the supply demand balance, how it shifts, and how you know how prices are likely to change over time. Let me let me. I, I I'm just kind of fascinated by this whole thing because um, uh, Cutter Qatar has bought a ton of futures on their uh, tankers. They've got orders in for a. They believe in their export for a long time. Do you factor in if a, con a country buys in a ton of LNG uh, tankers? Does that matter? Because, I mean, it's like all of a sudden going, man, we believe in this long-term LNG energy mix. How, do, does that, how does that factor in? I'm, I'm just amazed. Well, yeah, I mean, it does factor in for sure. I mean, we do keep track in, in our global system. We do keep track of of uh, orders for tankers and you know how the you know how this is likely to change over time and you can look at the various reports and see indicators of when new tankers are, would be needed in the marketplace right. oh, yeah you know when uh, utilization of existing tankers gets too high then what happens in the model is that the price of transportation goes up I've never right. seen so, your, I've never seen your software but I just nailed a very important part of your software it is a very important part yeah wow it, yeah so you know the the you know the model or the system is designed with economics in in mind and economics basically says we're going to try to find a solution you know a, nice. a a forecast that's economically reasonable and so what that means is that it's going to try to if it has two choices one uh, you know for the same right which i say the same cost supply one has to go 1000 miles and the other one has to go 5000 miles it's going to pick right. the one that goes 1000 miles right? right so i mean you know it it uses basic uh economic you know concepts that you know the um, you know the lowest cost supply is going to be you know delivered and accepted into the market before higher cost supply right uh, subject though to contracts because a contract could be made right. where it seems like it's not that economic but for whatever reasons it is made so we right. do recognize that and so that the system cool. will include those contracts as well you know, with COP28, and uh, you can thank Cyrus for, for this little animal this morning, but <laughs> when we're seeing such a big move that there is a a uh, a change in the paradigm shift where in COP28, natural gas, in COP26, I started following their language, they snuck in natural gas. And as they snuck in natural gas, COP27 was, yeah, so what? You know, it's it, they're trying, to, they got it. The Biden administration also dropped it in some of their language as well, that natural gas was needed for the transition. And now COP28 is really saying we need natural gas. So the world is now accepting that the renewable energy is having a little bit of a trouble and they need natural gas more. How does a model take into consideration the, the shifting of efforts may go to natural gas as the princess at the ball, if you would, it seems like natural gas is really gaining traction. Everybody's really trying to do that. If that makes sense. Well, I mean, I think it makes sense. And, and your argument, I think, makes sense. Uh, I don't think everybody buys it. You know, if you're out on LinkedIn. Uh, they don't. I get, well, if I you, get to, if you look at LinkedIn, you will see that there, you know, there are, uh, you know, there are lots of people who uh, I think are rational about, well, if you're really serious about um, reducing carbon dioxide right. emissions, uh, you know, that, you know, you can get more bang for your buck, if you will, by substituting natural gas for coal than just about anything else. Right. Uh, so, you know, that, you know, would make a lot of sense, but you have to have the natural gas be economical or else nobody's going to do it. So right. that's, you know, that's one of the things. Uh, there's starting to be, I think, a little bit more realism about renewables and uh, how, 
you know, whether they're truly clean and green or not. And, you know, what the mining costs are for doing all of this. And, you know, there's, there's a lot that's going on like that. And then you're getting a lot of pushback again from, uh, from sub-Saharan Africa. And also I think right. from the Indian subcontinent as well, uh, you know, where they feel like that they're having renewables pushed down their throat and, you know, and that that is not really to their own benefit. Uh, so I think you, you get that, but those are very small markets right now. So, right. but, you know, uh, if you look at future, uh, forecasts of population growth and that sort of thing, right. you know, the, the, the potential for natural gas in the, um, sub-Saharan Africa is huge, you know, in terms of yes. demand as well as supply. And, you know, what, you know, I think, you know, some time ago I was talking with, uh, some of my colleagues, very, very smart people, also educated at MIT and, and uh, very thoughtful, very good hearted people, you know, who were very, 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 very concerned about the climate and, and uh, climate change and so forth. And, and, you know, they were really kind of pushing me to tell them why I wasn't on that bandwagon. And right. I say, well, it's not that I'm necessarily uh, opposed to that. I just think right. that there's something else that's higher priority. And the highest priority in the world, as far as I'm concerned, are taking those uh, billions of people who are not really in 21st century economics uh, condition and bringing them up to something like par, you know, not necessarily right. par with the United States and Europe immediately, but even on par with the Chinese people on average. You know, would clean be, cooking, you know, and and right, and making it safe for them, clean cooking, uh, you know, cut down on deforestation because they're, you know, that you know their source of wood for fire uh, for um, heating and cooking is is firewood, you know, and and that's not good. It's and not you good cut for health the area so around you, and then they have to walk five miles there and five miles back for their wood. You bet. So that's one of the reasons why I got interested in LPG a few years ago, because actually yep. uh, liquefied petroleum gas, which comes from natural gas production, mostly, you know, is a really good solution, you know, for that, yep. you know, to and, and that ties in with natural gas as well. And so there are organizations like there's, uh, you know, there are a couple of different organizations that are heavy into LPG, which we can maybe talk about, you know, another time. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but I think, you know, that they are doing a great job. And um, uh, Kimball Chen is the head of uh, Global Partnership for LPG or something like that. Okay. Uh, he's, he's really a very thoughtful guy. I really like him a lot. And uh, he's working, he works at the country level. He works at, with the governments and you know, basically, you know, it gets buy-in from the governments, you know, that, you know, LPG, you know, would really be tremendously beneficial to your country. Right. But you have to develop a whole distribution system for it. And, you know, there's a lot that has to be done in order to make it really viable. Right. And there are many places in the world where this is already true, you know, Central America and, you know, Mexico and, you know, various other places have these kinds of markets and they're very workable. And it's a lot less expensive, by the way, than having to build out a natural gas distribution system. Absolutely. Uh, I just interviewed uh, Tucker um, Perkins, and he is the president of the propane uh, association in, in the U.S. I've got propane tanks. I got three propane tanks at my places and uh, I love propane. And I'll tell you what, it seems like uh, propane and and uh, the others are the great last mile uh, to the getting the heat and getting the cooking and and getting that there because you don't have the cost, but you do have to do the uh, infrastructure. But it sure seems well, a lot cheaper. Yeah, well, I mean, even in the United States, there's you know there's big markets there, uh, as you said. You know, you get into rural areas where you don't have a natural gas distribution network, you don't have a utility, you know, or an L, what they call LDC. Yeah. What are you going to do? Well, you have propane tanks, and you know, you go to whatever the propane store is, and you get your tank full, or however you do it. And yep. and so the point is, you know, that is a good, it's a good system. 
and it's a low cost system and it's very workable. And by the way, here's the other thing, creates jobs, you know, because that whole distribution, um, uh, you know, system, the whole um, That's job. You know, supply chain, you know, within that country means there's right. jobs all the way from the import, all the way to delivery and uh, to each of these customers. So, you know, and, and as Alex Epstein has said, you know, it's a, a humanitarian issue. So you're not wasting five miles a day to go get your wood. And then you're walking back five miles to get your wood so that you can either cook or clean or, or, or heat your water or anything else. You've got it right there. So, I mean, there, there, that's 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 a way of life of getting people out of that energy. Um, yeah, it creates time. It actually creates a huge amount of time for the people that can be spent doing other things that you know they may be able to make some money for. You exactly. know, so it really you know it really helps a lot of these. You know, it's not just residences, but it's also small businesses like. Uh, you know, yep. like your 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 local taco stand or something you know well you know they have that in uh, in places in in uh, africa or whatever it's not tacos but it's you know but it's sort of food that's needed by the people that you know is run by a, a woman usually you know who who doesn't have to spend two and three hours a day going and gathering wood you know yep. to actually run her little restaurant you know she can just run it on propane uh, so yeah there's a lot of uh, a lot of goodness associated with that and you know let's just face it you know the most people who are environmentally really very conscious or very involved or whatever probably don't really know these stories and right. they don't understand you know what the real impact would be of truly wiping out fossil fuels around the planet i mean it would be horrendous uh there's tremendous good you know that has uh, yes. arrived uh, as a result of even coal, you know, um, right, you know, right. just look at what the world was like or what the, you know, England was like before they started uh, using coal and, and building a manufacturing industries and all of this sort burning of stuff. Peat. Life was pre pretty darn grim. Right. Uh, Pete, burning peat is not exactly the, the cleanest either. <laughs> no, no. And I'll tell you, we've got about five more minutes, Dr. Okay. And Dr. Brooks, and I have just thoroughly enjoyed our conversation again. Um, thank you for coming by the podcast. I've enjoyed getting to know you and your son and your company. Um, you're in you're on the front edge of humanity, so to speak, you know, on trying to get the world lower cost uh, energy and understanding the entire market um you got your last word tell us any thoughts that you have uh it can be wide open tell me what you're thinking on the last thoughts here well um you know thanks Stu. i think you expressed it very well there i mean you know i think we would all you know most people in the world are are actually pretty good you know they've right. got you know they're they're most of the damage that's done and the destruction is done by us pretty small percentage of the people. Most people right. are actually pretty good. And I think most people in the developing world would like to see those people who are much less fortunate than them, you know, to do better. And they would like, you know, but they don't really know how they can help. I mean, they, they've got their own jobs and, you know, their own uh, problems right. with their raising their families and doing this and doing that. So even our company, you know, we've got as one of our goals, you know, that, um, that what we do in terms of providing, you know, really solid, really helpful analytics uh, to the energy industry will help the energy industry to make better decisions. If they yeah. make better decisions, it's going to be more economical. And in the end, that means that the cost of providing energy will be lower. And therefore, right? the price can be lower which means that lower priced products can go to the market, which means yep. people will be able to use these products for their benefit. Whereas if people are making a bunch of bad decisions and losing money all the time and, and so forth, then yep. the costs are gonna be higher and prices are gonna have to be higher. And then you know these other people are gonna be at, left out. Right. So 
you know, it's a, maybe it's a small thing to some extent. We're not in there, you know, building LPG plants in, in Cambodia and in Africa yeah. and so forth and so on. I mean, that would be an interesting business. And I hope that more people are doing those kinds of things. But from our perspective, we do it more from the sort of geek, quant, uh, nerd kind of way of providing you know, good software analytics to companies so that they can, again, make better investment decisions. You know, I'm going to brag on you and I'm going to brag on me for real quick. I, I'm over here trying to think of everything that I can think of that would go into that model. And I, I you already nailed everything that was in there going, yep, already thought about that. Yep, already thought about that. So I kind of like lost, I lost track of trying to stump you on, all right, what's in your model? What's in your model? And what's in your model? So well done in, in trying to figure out the dynamic that's a whole wild thing to price i just can't even imagine the, the algorithms um, well thank you and you know we have i mean it's not just me uh, we've got other people who work in the company and you know that are very bright and knowledgeable yeah. and so forth and and uh, of course we've got colleagues in other companies and so forth you know who help uh, and who've mentored me on my way so you know, it is a it is a collaboration, and and now we've got also people who are promoting. I think you know, rational and good solutions yep. through podcasts. Gee, I wonder who that is. Um, you know, I think that you know, there's a role for all of us to play here, and and I appreciate you giving us uh, time to to tell a little bit about our story. I really do appreciate that. And people can go find you on the R, uh, RBAC website, which is rbac.com. And uh, yeah, pretty simple, isn't it? I, my kind of website. So thank you so much for stopping by the podcast today, sir. Uh, well, you're very welcome. Thanks for inviting me. And I hope we have a chance to do it again. Absolutely. Absolutely.